Hello, everybody. Uh, today's September 20th, 2023, and I'm honored to have with me a uh, doctor, in a sense, uh, Kevin Bass, PhD, MS, and he's on his way to an MD, so he'll be Dr. Doctor uh, Kevin Bass. So he'll be a double base. Uh, anyway, tell us about yourself and your interests of late and, and uh, what has uh, you know kind of been different in your pathway. Um, Dr. Doctor is, a, is, a, is a, perhaps a questionable uh, postulate because um, you know, due to my COVID advocacy, um, you know, the way that medical schools work and the way that they students are evaluated and they're seen by medical schools is really a, a, a systemic process. It's a professional process, but within that professional process of evaluating students and uh, determining what their performance is or is not, uh, there's also the, the possibility of the potential and the reality of bias. And in some cases, that's individual. Um, each individual may have people that they like or they don't like. For example, maybe a natural ex introvert may uh, be put off by a, a, a super confident extrovert or vice versa, um, because people like basically what's similar to them. But uh, there's also more systemic biases. And this also relates to the way people are similar to them. So this has been documented in all sorts of different ways. Uh, in the past uh, decades, uh, we could talk about uh, different cultural backgrounds, et cetera. And those can be ways that people can be, uh, evaluations can be, can be changed. One of the issues with me in particular is, you know, my COVID advocacy uh, that has, a, you know, according to the perception of many mainstream doctors, perhaps harmed my reputation or, or affected the way that some people look at me. Uh, and I think that this has negatively affected the way that uh, my, my medical school education. I'm currently in a situation that is quite difficult in that respect. And, uh, you know, I, I believe in myself 100 percent. And I also think that since I've never done anything like wrong, uh, nobody can like like I can't be like like people can try to say that maybe uh, I should be in trouble for different things, but they can't really come up with anything, uh, I'm going to be okay in the long term, but it's a very miserable experience uh, having having spoken my mind in medicine. I, and I, I want to be encouraging to people, but I also want to tell people the truth. Uh, if you do speak out and uh, speak your mind, no matter how close you are to, uh, even I think in some ways completely, not even some ways, no matter how close you are to mainstream science, uh, like mainstream scientific debate, mainstream attitudes that were widely held among the public health community prior to March 2020, uh, you can still um, you can still make your life much more difficult than than it would otherwise be. Uh, small mistakes that you might make in medical school get blown up into bigger, bigger issues than they need to be. Uh, in some cases, people do make things up about you because there's always some people with some psychopathic tendencies in every uh, group and situation. So uh, you're just going to make yourself your life a little bit harder or maybe a lot harder than it needs to be by uh, speaking your mind. So for me, uh, you know, I could I could give you a big, long history and I'm exhausted right now today to do that because I've been doing that all day long uh, with different people. I've been meeting people all day long about different things and uh, I've been having these kinds of discussions. So I'm not going to go to my full history. Or I might, I might just do that. You know, that's exactly what I was just about to do. So maybe I'll go ahead and do that. So I wasn't a great student in high school. Um, part of that was family stuff that I was dealing with. Um, but then, you know, whenever I graduated high school, I decided I wanted to be a good student. So uh, since I hadn't been a good student, I had to go to community college. I did community college. I did, you know, a very heavy course load. I got straight A's, a 4.0. And then I did very well on the SAT because, of course, you know, because I have natural ability. So uh, I got into to UT Austin, University of Texas at Austin after, you know, in high school, I graduated maybe in the bottom 20% owing to my circumstances that were existing at home. So I only applied to UT Austin because my friends went there. I didn't know anything about college at all. And I remember receiving my acceptance letter and my parents were just flabbergasted because they never thought that that would happen. Uh, you know, UT Austin is a very good school, very reputable. So I went there, um, you know, the first, you know, the first you know, semester I partied, but then after that I was 
extremely serious student. I graduated with degrees in biology and anthropology. In anthropology, I kind of studied uh, my honors thesis, looked at uh, how psychiatric hospitals function, not necessarily from a scientific point of view, but if you think of it from an anthropological point of view. So many people who know a little bit about anthropology know that anthropologists will sometimes go to like places like Africa or the Amazon. They'll study tribes as if they're these sort of cultural systems. There's all sorts of different paradigms within anthropology, but that's sort of the idea is to sort of study these foreign and interesting uh, social arrangements, maybe perhaps shine, shine some light on our own selves. Well, what we were doing is something very similar to that, except instead of uh, looking at sort of uh, tribes in, tribes in the Amazon, we decided to look at a, a how a psychiatric hospital functions. So we studied it from that point of view. Now, it's not necessarily uh, you're going to lose some information if you don't understand the science, but you're also going to gain some information by sort of not taking that into account and by seeing it as a sort of social process or social system. And you'll, you'll gain some additional insights that you wouldn't otherwise have if you thought entirely as a doctor would see it. So that's what we did for my honor thesis. But after undergrad, you know, I was, I was, um, you know, I saw the world as a very, uh, in many ways, broken place. Uh, there's so much that was wrong with the world that is wrong with the world. And I thought if I became a doctor, I would be, be sort of participating in that, or at least I wouldn't be, um, you know, making the big impact on everybody's lives that I thought needed to be made in order for, you know, the world to be the place that it should be. So I thought going into medicine, um, you know, I wanted to heal the world. I wanted to make the world I wanted to heal the world. I thought that being a doctor wasn't enough, I guess. I don't know what it was. But after about five or six years of that, um, you know, I then realized it became a little bit more practical and realized, you know what, making a big impact on one person's life at a time uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an enormous and meaningful, deeply meaningful thing. You can't really cure all the world's problems. We're always going to have big problems in the world. And when we fix problems, we're going to create new problems. And whenever we have the revolutions that change everything, we're going to have a whole new set of problems compared to the ones we had before. So one thing we can do as individuals is we can make a positive impact on people's lives one day at a time, one person at a time. And I thought that medicine uh, being what it is would be a great way to do that, like perhaps one of the best ways to do that. Um, so then I decided to apply to med school, did the first two years of med school, thought it was great, but I also thought like we're kind of, um, we kind of had a surface understanding of like a billion different things. And in, in many ways, in order to do really well in med school, I had to kind of like turn off my curiosity sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that, um, that is the thing. <laughs> yep. So, so I was like, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. I want to learn. I want to understand things at a little bit deeper level. So I applied internally for, at first, the master's program, the MDMS. Uh, did very well during the master's program. They actually were talking about maybe graduating me in like two or three years, maybe as low as two years to get a PhD. Uh, so then I applied to the MD PhD program and I got into that. Uh, then I was like, you know what, this master's uh, degree that I did, um, it was good, you know, but I, I was kind of like a technician and the, the, you know, I was, it was very streamlined and I wasn't thinking as much as I wanted to. I wanted to be this real ideal scientist. So then I went off and I, left that lab and then I had to go through a few more labs to find the lab that I wanted. Uh, I ended up uh, working on this one project that fell through because we weren't able to reproduce some stuff that other investigators had said uh, and the field believed was a tried and true uh, understanding of that particular phenomenon. But eventually we, we, we settled on something that uh, I think was really cool. Uh, we, we discovered, we showed that in mammals, non-ruminant mammals that, you know, under normal fasting conditions, uh, the body creates ketones as a sort of metabolic substrate to uh, spare muscle. This is because the brain can't use free fatty acids, can only use glucose and uh, ketones. But, since, but, if it, but if it did only use glucose, then it would have to basically catabolize the muscle very rapidly. Within about 12 days, uh, uh, a fasting human would be dead. So in order to have good fasting physiology, you had to break down free fatty acids into something else that the brain could use to replace glucose. The body didn't have to use glucose to fuel the brain. And that substrate is ketones. So free fatty acids are broken down into ketones through a process of ketogenesis, and this occurs in the liver. Um, and uh, however, what we showed is that if you knock out these uh, pathways in the colon, then you reduce fasting ketones by like 20, 30 or 40% in the mouth. So we showed that actually in the mouse, uh, non-ruminant mammal, it's probably the case as well in 
to a significant degree in humans as well. Uh, uh, ketogenesis also takes place and is regulated substantially by the liver and not just by the, sorry, by the colon and not just by the liver. Uh, but we showed some other things as well, but I thought that was a really cool thing. You know, we added like a sentence to the biochemistry, the biochemistry textbooks of the future. Um, which I thought was a great achievement. You know, whenever you tell people about that, they're, they're amused because they're like, is that, you know, like that's the, but I feel like, you know, for us, like that's cool. Like I was very, I'm very excited about that. So, um, yeah, so then I, you know, start did the PhD, uh, finished the PhD. Now I'm starting my third year of med school. I think right around the time I was finishing a PhD, I started writing a little bit about COVID. And the reason I started doing this is I started realizing a lot of the, Basically, I started questioning things a lot more because I started realizing a lot of the so-called evidence-based community is not as evidence-based as it claims to be um, on a lot of different topics. Uh, they're very selective and partial to all sorts of different kinds of interests. So I started questioning things, and then at some point, I just got so fed up, and I started making tweets about COVID, uh, and that um, ultimately culminated in some thread that I posted that went viral on Twitter. Uh, I was like, this is like by far the biggest most viral thread I've ever had. Uh, it got like 10,000 retweets, which at the time was like a huge deal for me. Um, yeah, and then I just, I, I felt like I was resonating with people with that, the things I was saying about COVID were uh, really touching people. I, whenever I said that I thought that the medical community was wrong, I was wrong about COVID, uh, it touched people. Because, you know, at the beginning of COVID, I was all all on board with uh with the sort of ideas of, of, of the COVIDians, of the people who thought that we should basically shut down all of society, weld people into their apartments, and, uh, and, and, and make sure that nobody can spread COVID. We can eliminate COVID completely from all of society just if we follow these simple uh, 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 public health recommendations. And I really believe this stuff, and I believe that everybody else who was going against this was spreading disease, causing people to die, and they're basically murders. Uh, through misinformation. And I essentially reversed that perspective and I started to see, hey, you know, people who uh, have a different view about COVID are not just like, they're not just wrong or following misinformation, but they just have a different view of the way the world works and a different view of what the science says than the view that I have. Uh, and then I started sort of advocating for that view while also continuing to hold in some ways my own view, but just learning about that view, being open to it and, and, and imbibing it. And so I remember Jay Bhattacharya, uh, uh, he replied to one of my threads with a report that he made, and I read about that report. And then uh, Bacha Ungar Sargon at Newsweek uh, wanted me to do an op-ed, so I did an op-ed. I read her work, and I read Jay's work, and I kind of put a lot of that stuff together and wrote this super viral op-ed that was like one of the most viral op-eds that's been in a while. So uh, that, that blew up, and then I went to Tucker Carlson, and then I destroyed my life after going on Tucker Carlson because... Now I've been on Tucker Carlson and I'm officially a bad person. Huh. Uh, according, well, according well, not in my book. I think Tucker's great. Right. I love Tucker too. Um, so, so, but, you know, but according to the COVIDian or the medical establishment, I'm a bad person. I'm probably a white supremacist, a fascist and like misogynist and like all the other bad words. Right. So, um, yeah. So, so now, now we're kind of in my current situation. Um, I would say I have a big personality, and I think that, um, you know, it's something that I've had to learn about. I'll learn, I've had to learn a lot and change a lot during med school, and I really have, uh, I've changed pretty dramatically, but I still make people mad, and I think that um, maybe I come across as rude to some people, and I think that that combined with sort of my COVID advocacy has, has um, been, it's made things pretty rough for me, so... I'm, I'm both developing as a medical student and also trying to defend my ability to continue to develop as a medical student because of, uh, you know, these issues. Things get made up about me, including by administrators, including by uh, people who should know better, who should, should be more professional. Uh, and I also have to deal with that as well. Those things, honestly, though, are so egregious and it's like so documentable and so easy to show that they're wrong, that it's like nobody really takes those seriously. But it's sort of the fact that, um, like, it's just like kind of a difficult situation. People don't want to deal with it anymore. So, um, but they're going to have to keep dealing with it so long as we have to keep dealing with it. I mean, right. so I'm going to be a medical question. student. So, so, what, a doctor. so what medical yeah. school are you in? What, what was, in your view, COVID advocacy? And, and uh, what is the general gestalt, of, you know, the thinking of, of medical students in general? 
Um, are they questioners? Are they kind of followers? Um, and, and, you know, how does, how does having a PhD affect being a medical student? So, so in order, uh, what medical school are you at? Uh, what, you know, what's wrong with saying, saying your thoughts? I mean, wouldn't that be a great attribute for a physician? So I'm not going to talk about what medical school I'm at just because I don't want to, there's no reason to, especially in the context of this discussion. Okay. Um, the, 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 I mean, people can find it, but it's like, it's really not relevant. I will say that many people at this medical school have supported me, who have um, listened to me and have taken seriously my uh, uh, confidence, my claim that I'm you know, going to be a great doctor. I think many people do believe that like many, many people high up in the administration, uh, many people who are program directors. Um, I get a lot of support here. So um, that's that. And I think that if I was at some place like Harvard or something, it would be a much different situation. I would get destroyed very quickly. Uh, so I think, I think that um, people here have been very good to me and uh, kind to me. And I would never suggest that, um, um, I'm not in maybe one of the better situations that I could possibly be in, and that's owing to much of that support. I will say, as far as uh, sort of COVID advocacy, what do you mean by COVID advocacy? You mean what I've done, or what, what, uh, um, like what the COVIDians do, or, or what? Well, what, what's what's been your what what were your recommendations? What what did you, you know, what was your stance, uh, and you know what what did you think was egregious during COVID? Uh, where where did you draw the line? Yeah, obviously, I think one of the big things is lockdowns. Lockdowns are not effective. In theory, they could potentially be effective if you have a totalitarian government that literally welds people in their apartments or sends the police out whenever they see that you've gone outside and you've been exposed to another person who's been sick and you have reported to the police and quarantine or whatever, like they did in China, potentially. I mean, maybe. Uh, but in the Western world, in any free country, and I think even maybe in China itself, ultimately the virus catches up so we can have lockdowns for like six months but then the virus is going to catch up and kill people anyway so i think it's been very it's been shown very clearly that there's no strong correlation between lockdowns and long-term excess mortality if anything i would say in some context some social some countries uh the social situation is so unstable or there's certain circumstances that make lockdowns actually very harmful and i think in uh the united states in particular lockdowns were very harmful uh, and resulted in a lot of excess deaths that didn't have to happen. I don't think they were effective at all. I think they actually caused a lot of social discord, social problems that caused excess deaths. For example, uh, alcoholism, drug use. But I think I'm going to say something controversial. I think the Black Lives Matter protests were sort of displaced lockdown protests. They were essentially people being bored about the lockdowns and, and, and stressed out and all that stuff. And so that all that got fueled and, and pushed into the Black Lives Matter protests, and ultimately that resulted in a lot of de-policing. And de-policing has definitely caused the loss of many, ironically, black lives. So, um, you know, I, I, I admire, I think that it's great to fight for justice, and it's great for, to, to fight for people's health, and it's great to fight for people's rights. All that stuff is a beautiful thing, and racism does exist, and, and certainly uh, discrimination exists, and unfairness exists. People can be quite horrible. Humans can be very terrible to each other. And so we need to remember that and try to fight for people who uh, are not as strong as us. I truly believe that. But I think in the case of the Black Lives Matter protests, they did not lead to anything productive. And I think they probably cost a lot of people their lives. Yeah, and it was also an interesting irony. When, when people got, when a bunch of bikers got together, uh, what is that place in North Dakota, Sturgis, um, you know, bike rally, uh, I don't know, tens of thousands of bikers yeah got together and everyone was like, oh my God, this is going to cause a COVID event. How horrible, how horrible, how horrible, you know, because they were bikers, I guess. But then, you know, like days later, they have, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people aggregated in cities burning stuff. It's like, oh my God, they're expressing this. This is, this is a public health need, you know, to, you know, yeah. you know, to, to voice your concerns as a public health positive. And so <laughs> everything got upended for, you know, whatever many weeks that required, including occupying Portland and whatnot. So it was kind of an oddity. Uh, the public health, you know, became this kind of political um, yeah. kind of mommy, um, you know, saying what, which things you can eat, which things you can. Like Sturgis is bad. You know, if you get together on a motorcycle and have a bunch of people together, that's bad. If you get a bunch of people together and you're burning things down, that's good. <laughs> it's just kind of an odd thing. And yes, I, I do think that Black Lives Matter. I mean, personally, I think they, they cherry picked a lot of their 
their cases. Originally, uh, you know, Michael Brown, the gentle giant that brought about the Ferguson riots, was a strong arm, um, uh, you know, kind of a thug. Uh, um, George Floyd, you know, hugely problematic guy. Um, you know, he, he had brutally uh, beaten a pregnant woman, and uh, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff. That's to say, not that's not to say he deserved anything he got. Um, but I don't think the guy tried to kill him. I think it was inadvertent. Anyway, um, so so where where does medical school lead you, and where what's your what's your kind of you know personal homeostasis like? Uh, have you managed to maintain uh, kind of a thoughtful attitude, or have you? I mean, you know, kind of like I mean thoughtful. I mean, uh, clearly you're thoughtful, but kind of a copacetic. Um, you know, life balance. Maybe that's not a thing in uh, third year of medical school. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think um, um, you also asked another question earlier and that maybe this dovetails into this, maybe it doesn't, but I want to answer, I want to be comprehensive and answer all your questions. The other question was uh, how do other medical students think? Are they, do they just kind of go along with things? And in general, uh, medicine is a, is a strict hierarchy. That's, I think that's the way that it is. It's always been that way. Uh, and you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing in some ways, right? Because you have the wisdom of people who are the authorities and, uh, you have lives that are at stake. That wisdom is the result of many years of experience and reading and studying. And so therefore somebody without that wisdom experience is probably more often than not going to be right by mm -hmm. listening to authorities and yielding and essentially doing what the authorities say that are above them in the hierarchy. And so in that sense, it's not a, it's not, since the stakes are so high, people's lives, it's not, a, it's not a bad thing. I think medicine has always been like that. Uh, I do think nonetheless that there is a place for independent thinking and there is a place for independent speech about uh, issues as scientific problems within medicine, because there's always going to be scientific problems. There's always going to be things that medicine is wrong about. There's always going to be things that medicine has to learn. And uh, I think we should be open to that process. And especially that is the case when uh, medicine has become sort of highly influenced by a certain political perspective. If the science actually gets biased by that certain political perspective, then we need alternative perspectives within medicine in order to um, push back against that particular interpretation of science and have a real scientific discussion. And I think in the case of COVID, which is very, I would say the COVIDian ideology, the sort of ideology that we want lockdowns and we want to force people to get vaccinated and you want to force people to wear masks because you, that's what you need to do as a compassionate human being. You, you should be a compassionate human being. That's a very, uh, that's an ideology that's been highly influenced by, I would call wokeism, which is sees everybody as a victim. We've got to go protect all the victims and got to make sure that the oppressors who are the people who in the COVID case who are denying the fact that COVID is maybe as much of an issue as people say it is, they're victimizing the victims and we got to stop these people and shut them up and make sure that they're censored and kicked off YouTube and Twitter because they're murderers. And so I think that's a very woke idea. And I think that that idea uh, needs to be challenged within medicine. And I don't think medicine should be as political as it's becoming. And so I think that we do need people to speak. We do need uh, lively arguments about everything in every situation, because there will always be certain circumstances where uh, ideas that are bad have they reign for too long and they need to be torn down. And that's always going to occur in medicine. And we always need some people and some place for us to challenge that because that's part of progress. Well, I agree. You know, I think that, uh, you know, science is uh, two terms. I mean, there's really, there's the body of knowledge that we think of as science and this thing called scientific process, which is the the act of producing that other stuff, the first, you know, the, the body, you know, part one. Um, and and it's and all, you know, science is never settled. Science is never by dictate. Uh, science is a matter of observation and correlation, repetition, um, uh, reformulation, and, you know, agreement or not. And, and if you don't have that, you don't have anything, you know, uh, I, I could, I might very well think that, I don't know, uh, Julia Roberts is a bit, is the best actress on earth and she deserves every Academy Award from here on in. Uh, and I, I'm welcome to that opinion. Um, and I can have posters of her on the wall, but it's not science. That, that's, that's a wish. And that's a desire or something like that. But over time, you know, those Academy Awards and frankly, you know, any, anything that we kind of personally or publicly adjudicate, you know, I've, I've made, um, the point repeatedly that uh, people know far more about Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard, who's right, who did what, uh, who deserved the money, who, you know, how, how they should have parsed their lives and what he did on her bed or vice versa and so forth. I don't know what she did on his bed. I have no idea. People are far more aware of the facts of that case and they can make a 
rather informed decision about it. People, you know, captivated by this stuff. And and for the things that, that are going to lock them down, whatever, they have no idea. They're willing to abdicate all, you know, kind of judicial or, or, or opinionated aspects of it. And they're just going to really devout to somebody like Dr. Fauci, who, you know, tells you to do X, Y, and Z, and then doesn't do it himself. You know, we've seen over repeatedly, you know, Gavin Newsom's and uh, Cuomo and whatever, you know, they, 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 they tell people to do stuff. They don't do it themselves. Boris Johnson around the other side of the globe, you know, he basically lost his job because they were partying during COVID. You know, it's either one thing or another. It's either that serious or it's not. And so there was so much, um, you know, kind of this uh, kind of class aspect to it uh, that I found reprehensible. Yeah. Anyway, that's my I little know, hmm? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's elite versus uh, it's like an elite. Uh, I mean, it's, the lockdowns are very easy for people who, who live on their laptops, who work on their laptops, who, exactly. who are able to who are able to have those conditions that will allow them to lock down. Uh, yeah. It's very inconvenient for people who 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 are out in the world. Yeah, I mean, to live. I know. I'll, I'll, I came up with a whole bunch of uh, uh, kind of like oxymoron situations. I mean, they were oxy and they're moron uh, situation. Um, but uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I, I belong to various number of groups and organizations, a congregation, um, you know, religious congregation, the sports club, uh, tennis club. Anyway. Any rate. At, at, at the tennis, I mean, most of them are populated by people left of center. And at the tennis club, for instance, we play squash also. And in the middle of the winter, they're leaving the doors and you know windows all completely open. Um, so these are the same people like a year ago, like all green, you know, don't burn any fossil fuel, uh, all this kind of stuff, you know, conserve this, put this away, you know, uh, you know put, uh, you know, I don't know, double pane windows up, you know, all this kind of stuff that, to insulate your house so that you never waste a drop of, of uh, oil, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we got to leave the heater on, or in, in the summer we leave the air conditioner on when the windows open. I, I've been, and I'm the treasurer of one of these groups, and it's like, of, of my congregation, it's just like, you know, we don't have the cash for this. Like, I mean, your ideas are are off kilter, but but I'm I'm actually dealing and arguing with a fair number of physicians and people much more credentialed than I am. And one, you know, one of my clubs has, uh, you know, I'm in Boston, you know, the mecca. Uh, of medicine and one of the major hospitals, you know, heads infectious diseases. So, but, but I, I've just been like jaw drop shocked um, that, that they don't have anything really to back them up. But I've been screamed at and basically kind of quasi assaulted, at the very least accosted and screamed at a few different occasions uh, in person for, you know, frankly stuff that, that has been obviously proven to be correct over time that you don't, need to wear masks outdoors. Uh, you know, you, your being vaccinated has nothing to do with my not or whatever, which vaccine. Anyway, you know, boosters are, are I mean, again, I, I actually believe, I believe that, that boosters are completely accurate only in the partial spelling. There's a B and S. There's a BS to them, you know, that um, anyway, let, let me ask you on a, uh, without diatribing any more than I have uh, on a personal basis, you know, do they, kind of keep track of your boosterism, uh, whether you're a booster booster or not? Uh, do you have to be continually boosting up on more coronavirus, uh, you know, ancestral SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein um, and adjuvant and so forth and in order to, you know, see patients and whatnot? No, I think, um, uh, so, so I think, so I'm in med school in the South. We are a pretty conservative place. Now, certainly the administration is mostly on the left, but it's, you know, uh, the decisions made here are not generally uh, super COVIDian and super orthodox in that direction. Uh, I think they're a little bit more reasonable. I think the policies here, we were pretty early on dropping masks in the clinical context here. And I think that's because we have a little bit more of a conservative bent here. Um, so, uh, no, they. I think there is a requirement for COVID vaccine, although I'm not 100% sure. Maybe there's some context in which it is it's required. I was vaccinated um, because, you know, of course, I was a big believer in the vaccine. And we could talk about that if you want to at some point. But certainly boosters are not. And in my case, I got pericarditis from a booster. Oh, wow. So I'm yeah, I think the CDC is actually at this point uh, endorsing the idea that if you get pericarditis from a booster, you don't need to go keep getting boosters. Thankfully, they say that. So I think I would have some support if our, my school did decide to start enforcing such a thing. But um, yeah, no, I, uh, I'm fortunate to be at a somewhat conservative, I mean, in a, in a quite conservative city. 
and, and in a conservative area. And so that does influence the policies here. And um, that's probably part of the reason why I haven't been kicked out of med school yet. It's like I'm still, still I mean, I'm not even I'm, I'm not even joking. Like I'm still like kind of have a chance of graduating. It's only because I live in sort of a conservative area. Otherwise, I'd be gone, I'm sure. So, what, kind, what, what, or, what kind of physician uh, uh, or type of practice do you envision? Uh, I want to be a psychiatrist. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did. I did part of a psychiatry residency. Um, I left it. I, I went into you know kind of general primary care. Oh, interesting. Over time, we can we can trade stories. Uh, I don't know. We have to do it on on video, but um, you know we could uh, trade stories offline if you like. Um, I, I found psychiatry, I mean, I, I, I'm a science guy. I was chemistry and physics major, a BS, uh, that's the other kind of BS, Bachelor of Science. And I was, you know, pretty technical oriented and, you know, also good with the SATs and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm a good puzzle guy. I like math puzzles and word puzzles. And all, anyway, but, but, you know, medical school, as you were kind of mentioning, alluding to earlier, uh, is, is a little bit of a closing of the mind. You know, college had been a big awakening for me, all these subjects and, and really smart people around. And, um, you know, it never stopped. Like you had dinner discussions and it was just kind of like, wow, a lot of knowledge and so forth. I had one compliment along the way. I kind of got into college young. I was uh, 16 when I started. And somebody said, oh, by the time we graduated, well, it's like I thought you were just kind of like a, I don't know. It was kind of, it's a semi compliment when it's left handed compliments like you were really, you know, an empty vessel when you got there. You didn't really know very much. And then you kind of became articulate. Blah, blah, blah. So I was like, oh, that, that's really nice. I appreciate that. But but then medical school comes along and there's very little. Then nothing's required of you. They don't really want to hear what you say. It's kind of I thought a reasonable example is being in the military. Like you show up, yep. you might be a really smart guy. You might be Albert Einstein in the military, but you're a private. Like nobody is really interested in your opinions about like how we should organize making the beds or what time we should get up or any of that stuff. It's like just do it and, and shut up. And so medical school has an aspect to that. And along the way, you know, various clerks and whatnot. But I found that psychiatry, you know, didn't have kind of the same classifications. And so when you have a lot more kind of liberty and, and difference uh, of yeah. the type of patients who come in, I mean, clearly, you know, there's so many different personalities and and, and context and age and what anyway you put them all together and you have unique all the time um but uh you know as far as like sticking with it that's another story um but that might be more about me than psychiatry mm. no I, I love psychiatry i feel like it's a perfect fit for me that culture um is is so welcoming to me and i did so well everything is so natural no difficulty so i felt i was like the ways that i was competent uh, were rewarded the ways that I had questions were rewarded everything was uh, I think I just felt like I was I was just I was treated great I got a 95 percent on my evals in on that rotation and uh, I want to go back and I'm I don't want to be in any other rotation honestly so um, yeah it helps to learn all the other stuff too <laughs> yeah I know it does and plus I know, you know no, it, it's fun it's it's just that uh, it's just, it was it's just, it was such a good fit for me. That's that's. Uh, yeah. Well, I have to say, I mean, I, I wasn't expecting it I, when I did my clerkship in psychiatry. It was just like, okay, I'm ready to do this, and then I was like, oh, this is quite fascinating. Um, but uh, you know, there are some limitations. I mean, when you do become it depends on what kind of psychiatrist you become. Um, but you know, it's 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 getting medicated. You know, a lot of things are sure. you know, going down the medical uh, pathway. Sure. And, and, a little bit of rigor about what you're supposed to be doing um, and what, you know, everything's a medical answer. I'm not sure that's really yeah. in humanity uh, per se. Yeah. 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 Psychiatry has its problems for sure. Yeah. But uh, so when you had your pericarditis, I mean, I, you're in the middle of medical school there. Uh, what was the word on that? I mean, not that it's quite related, but, you know, Damar Hamlin, um, you know, sudden death uh, in, in Buffalo Bills, uh, Bengals game, I believe, playoffs, um, or well, anyway, one of the final games of the year, and um, and then again, LeBron James' son, you know, quasi sudden death. I, I'm not saying either one of those were vaccine related, but there were young men. And this is kind of seems to be happening a little bit more at FIFA uh, database and whatnot. Um, do people there, you know, do they get vaccine skeptical in your presence? Do, is it is it tied together? I mean, I don't think you can make an absolute tie. For any of these things per se on an individual basis, but um, what, what, what did that 
present to people or do you bring it up? Um, I'm uh, besides the COVID vaccine, I don't have a, a, a deep knowledge of vaccines. Uh, I know quite a bit about the COVID vaccine, but not, not the others. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we have a lot of vaccine skeptical or anti-vax patients. I think that's probably increased because of COVID and because of the policies and because I think anti-vax became very powerful during COVID, like anti-vax, quote unquote. Like, uh, But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, we're, we're doctors, right? So we're pretty pro-vaccination. Um, and um, I don't think we've yet had a discussion about the COVID vaccine. Uh, there's a very brilliant doctor here who has mentioned potentially having it. Uh, I don't know if we're going to have that. And I don't think we're going to, def- I don't think we're going to have a very critical one. I'm not sure, but um, we might, I mean, I don't having, know. Like, having a what? what, what what's what, having a what? What do you mean? Crit- you said a critical... we might have, there's a doctor here. We might have what? a conversation, might have... a conversation, oh. like some lecture on the COVID vaccine. I, 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 we haven't had a, I'm on peds right now. So um, we're, we would have that during peds if we're going to have that, right. but uh, we haven't we haven't had that. No. We, have, so, we watched like we watched a presentation on like the new CDC guidelines, but that's not a real discussion. Right. Yeah, well, it's an interesting thing. I th- this is the, the image that came to me a couple of days ago. Um, actually, I, I was happened to be in a small claims court um, for a contractor. I you know it's a very few minutes of my time, and um, I'm pursuing a contractor who did bad things. Anyway, I'm, I'm there and this woman, uh, they had a criminal case before us and she's, and it was a, it was like a 70, 80 degree day and she's wearing a parka and a whole bunch of other stuff and a mask, all kinds of stuff. I'm like, mm, you know, I, I'm not sure when, when you see somebody on a 75 degree day, who's wearing uh, winter clothing, you know, big puffed out jacket and, and every, you know, there, there's something wrong there. And so anyway, the image I came up with is, is like, if somebody comes up to you wearing all that stuff and it's a you know 80 degree day and you're wearing at the beach, you're wearing a bathing suit, that person says, Oh my God, are you anti-clothing? You don't have much clothes clothing on. It's like, well, th- I'm wearing what's appropriate for the for the beach. It's 80 degrees, so forth. I mean, if you're wearing a bathing suit in the in the winter or you're wearing a parka in the summer, you're doing something wrong. I mean, my, my point here is it, it, it's not that, that you're pro or anti-clothing. You have to wear the right amount of clothing for the situation. And I think we've just put on so many layers of clothing in, in the vaccine schedule. And some of them are good. Some of them are not. I mean, some things I always wear, like I'm not going to wear socks and shoes, whatever. So there's a lot of things you're going to wear and regardless, but you don't wear every bit of your clothing all the time. And I think this yeah. is what's been the misconception about vaccines. A vaccine might be good, but it doesn't mean everybody needs to have it all the time. And sure. I think there has to be some kind of selection pro, you know, process uh, for that, so you're not wearing you're not you know wearing 15 layers of clothing on a 90 degree day, medically speaking. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about vaccines. I know I know a little bit about the COVID vaccine and the trade offs, and I think certainly in the case of the COVID vaccine, uh, the United States is stands stands as a an a, 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 an exception to the rule worldwide that uh, some groups are not generally recommended the COVID vaccine, and other groups are. Uh, here in the United States, everybody above six months of age is universally recommended to get it. I think that's probably wrong, uh, or almost certainly wrong. Um, but uh, we do that that way here, and I think that that might also be the case for other vaccines to, to varying degrees. I do worry that uh, uh, the pendulum can swing too far in the other direction. I think we should be very nuanced and careful about that because vaccines uh, in some contexts and for some applications, I think we can say at the very minimum, can say that uh, are, 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 are beneficial for at least some groups, and some vaccines are probably ben- beneficial for many groups. So uh, we need to be careful about... Uh, yeah, no, you uh, don't want to throw the baby yeah. out with the bathwater, especially if you're in pediatrics. <laughs> right, especially in the middle of pediatrics, right? Yeah, it would be a bad look. Anyway, um, I, I'm sure you are hungry, tired, uh, all that medical student stuff. Um, do you have any closing words for us? Oh, man. Um, I don't want to sound too morbid. Uh, um, um, p- pray for me. <laughs> pray for me. Honestly, my, my situation is dire, and um, I think I'll get through it. It's just um, it's uh, it's tough. And, okay, uh, so, so you're going to have to, uh, if you want my prayers, I mean, I, I'm willing to pray for you generally, but specifically, 
what's your biggest impediment, you think? I mean, you, you, you can learn the stuff. You're smart enough, correct? I mean, is, yeah. is it the hours, the, the, the general medical student stuff, or is there something specifically to you? Um, you know, uh, I don't want to take the, I don't want to take the devil's advocate against myself. Honestly, I'm kind of sick of, of, uh, of, of doing that. I can easily do that. Um, and I can easily, let me think whether I should do that. Um, I don't know if I should even do that. That might even be ill-advised. Um, yeah, we can hold on. You know, you know, I think I think you know I've I've talked to to to, to some people who who have been involved in medical education education are involved uh, very very widely respected individuals. I show them some of the things that are written about me in my evaluations, right. and they tell me uh, that's normal. That's part of being a medical student and progressing as a medical student. And for whatever reason, those normal things. Um, and, and everybody has their own strengths and weaknesses, but for whatever reason, my particular weaknesses, those normal things are being considered worse. So for example, whenever I talk to other students about the difficulties that they're experiencing, I just had this really interesting conversation today with several other students. I'm like, those, those people are experiencing the same exact problems I'm experiencing as medical students, but they're not getting penalized. Hmm. And it's just like, why is it that, you know, I'm facing discipline whenever other people are having the same issues, they're not facing it. And um, yeah, that's, that's, that's I think that's really what it's about. Like you can always come up with something, uh, a subjective way of seeing a shortcoming and then and then kind of blow it out of proportion. And I think that's what essentially happened. And so I'm not able to learn. I'm I'm learning, but it's in this very under this sort of punitive framework. And I'm also defending myself all the time. I'm learning what I need to learn. I'm learning what everybody else is. But it's been it's it's a. Uh, it's basically using up a huge amount of my time in order to do this. No, it's thing. wearing. It, it wears on you. And, oh, uh, it's terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. But, you know, it's also building resilience, and this is the only thing I want. So this is this is the only thing I want. So I'm going to keep doing it until they kill me or something. They can kill me. They, they'll go for that. That's fine. Well, hopefully only then. figuratively. Um, yeah. So fair enough. Um, we, we could, you know, talk again offline about some of those issues. You know, I, I – I, I I don't think I was really aware of this as as a child because um, I think it was pretty well well mannered and mild and you know I did all my grades well enough I didn't have your kind of situation I went you know kind of right from a young age into Yale and you know my grades were always good I never really had to study much and and um, compared to everybody else I never did an all nighter even medical school aside from the commanded ones you know when you're on call and whatnot I never did a med an all nighter medical school. I never did it all I had in college and high school or anything like that. You know, I wasn't doing drugs. I wasn't drinking. And, you know, so I was really fairly well behaved as a student. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have an affinity for subjects and whatnot. But I have to say that all being said, you know, my medical career has a little bit, you know, has a maverick street. And, um, you know, I, I think there are there. Are, when you if you read back, if I were a novel, you could probably see some aspects of it on on page 35. You know, before you get to page 250, um, but you know, I have had issues, or, the, or you know, with authority on it on occasion, and that's maybe because I'm, you know, I don't know, I, you know, maybe veer towards thinking I know too much, and sometimes I do. Sometimes I know more than some other people. You're right. On the topic. Right. But but frankly, all the time. no nobody likes that. <laughs> nobody likes right. to be proven wrong. It's not like everyone says, "Oh my God, thank you so much." Uh, in my case, Randy. Uh, for being uh, correct about the COVID thing. I was, you know, a fool. I, I stayed indoors, you know, for three years and never went out to dinner. Uh, you were having a great time. You're fine. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, you were right. You know, like that does not happen. People only double down on their decisions. And there's a, you know, you'll, I'm sure you know, cognitive dissonance. And so nobody, nobody comes and thanks you after the fact. Just doesn't happen. Um, so some of that stuff, you have to figure out a, a different way in a manner to, um, to promulgate it. And that's difficult these days because, you know, what's public is private and vice versa. And um, I'm not, you know, you're using the term woke. I kind of think it's critical race theory and and and, and kind of Marxist uh, tendencies. Yeah. But we're in, a, we're in a difficult phase. We're in like our quasi-Soviet phase and it's a sadness. Yeah. It doesn't have yeah. to be that way. Yep. We are in a quasi-Soviet phase on that. We absolutely, well, we probably agree on a lot of things, but we certainly agree on that. So, Yeah. 
All right, so Kevin, thank you so much for your time. Uh, before we go, I'd like to do a shameless uh, self-promotion here uh, for our listeners who have managed to stick around this long. Uh, they're definitely going to want to uh, see this next thing. This is uh, um, my book. Uh, it is Overturning Zika, which I hope to do just that. Um, Zika microcephaly, I don't think they cover in medical school anymore or how far south you are, but this was a problem in the tropics in Brazil principally, and then it was um, imputed to uh, be happening everywhere else. Um, uh, and this book is basically overturning Zika, the pandemic that never was. Uh, if you want to support my podcast, you can buy the book. Uh, even better if you read it, it comes with a picture of me on the cover. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some interesting side stories. I'm not going to go too far into it, except, uh, you know, Zika, basically there are four dengues. Uh, dengue is a real virus. And, and Zika was never really counted as dengue number five. They're actually named dengue one, two, three, and four. And Zika would be number five if, if it had ever caused a single human illness. Never had, and never will, doesn't do it. It's not, a, it's not a, it's maybe a monkey virus, something like that. It doesn't do anything to people. And then somehow, uh, this is the, I'll give you, I'm gonna give you like a minute. So in Northeast Brazil in 2014, before this, there were a group of doctors because that's the poor area. It's kind of upside down from the U.S. So it's like the, the, their north is like our south, hotter, poor, darker skin, blah, 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 and uh, less industrial and a little bit chip on their shoulders. And they wanted an illness. So a group of doctors formed a group called Chick V, the virus, Chick for chikungunya. Uh, I don't know if you've studied that one. Uh, v, the virus. And they call it Chick V, the mission, named after the Robert De Niro movie 1986, where the Jesuits helped the uh, got any Indians in Paraguay? What anyway? So they saw themselves the embodiment of helping the poor souls of the Northeast by by finding they wanted to find a virus that had never been there. And they were thinking it was going to be chikungunya, and they wanted to be there so they could bring money and attention to the Northeast of Brazil. And so, frankly, their their dreams were were fulfilled, or prayers were fulfilled more wildly than they could have imagined. And so Zika microcephaly began with this worldwide you know pandemic of sorts, and, and money and attention did go to the Northeast Brazil, but frankly it has not brought them benefit because uh, the birth rates are down, people are terrified, um, they, they you know, kind of not quite shelter in place, but if you're pregnant and young women, you know, you stay indoors, you slather on insect, insect repellent, even now, and um, you know, so there's huge upheaval, and there, women were told not to have babies, so there's probably about a half a million or more, what I call ghost children in the tropics, babies who were never brought to be um, because their parents were terrified. And so we don't know how many families broke up and this and that over this misapprehension. So Zika microcephaly was thought to be a thing in 2015 based on only a, a dozen or so cases in Recife. Then, then panic was, uh, they, they dropped the news without any medical studies, went into the press, became a huge panic. And um, and by 2016, the, the next time they could have even found it, it was gone. There had been no Zika tests at all in the world at the time. Uh, the only way they actually decided that Zika caused microcephaly was they found, uh, it was, again, I'm probably talking too much, but the one doctor, you know, decided, the way he decided Zika caused microcephaly, he called 30 moms of babies who had had microcephaly um, based on probably wrong criteria. Anyway, he asked, we called them up, said, do you have any fever rash and chills during pregnancy? They're in the Northeast tropics, you know, the hot, hot, hot weather. Everybody said yes. Like 29 of them said yes. He said, oh, that must have been Zika. And and it was off to the races. He, he announced, I mean, I believe he leaked, it was leaked to the press, I believe, by this particular doctor. And then, then all of a sudden there were thousands of cases. And they all disappeared when the panic disappeared. And once they started getting actual Zika tests by the next year or two um, and, and had be better standards for microcephaly, they didn't find any real Zika. They didn't find any microcephaly. And nobody's backed down from this. And it's a whole institution that everybody, I don't know if it gets taught in medical school. You can tell me that later. Um, but it, it's a thing. And so my book is there to, to overturn that. And I actually came up with this before COVID-19 came around. And the editors of JAMA uh, were interested in publishing it. But early 2020, they said, we would publish this. But for the fact that COVID's coming around, well, they called it coronavirus, was coming around. And we don't want to sow any doubt in the public health establishment, which, which needs oh, some. Oh, God. And so yeah. that, that's, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, and uh, I don't know. What else? That's it. Yeah, that's cool. That's interesting. I don't know anything about Zika. That's um, not wouldn't be surprising if, if uh, Zika turned out to be kind of a, I don't want to use the word hoax, but uh, maybe a kind of a hoax. So. It was an aggrandizement. The, the, the thing is, the, the, thing, the parts that are redolent of today or recent today um, is that it was it, it, it's a bad, bad thing ostensibly. If it, it were true, let's stipulate it is true. It was taken up politically 
um, for, because abortion's illegal in Brazil. Uh, it, the pro-abortion crowd wanted this so much to be, and they pushed it. They went for emergency injunctions to get immediate abortion uh, possibilities across the board. Mm -hmm. And so this became a cause celebre throughout Latin America and wherever abortion statutes are you know, stricter than, than those people want it to be. And so mm -hmm. it, it's, it's kind of a, not quite a death cult, but um, there was the same thing was going on. The people who thought there are too many people on earth saw this as a chance to make a birth moratorium. And they announced it. That WHO aligned physicians announced it. And certain you know, health ministers throughout Latin America and the Caribbean went along with this and told their, their populace not to have kids at all till a Zika vaccine. And mind you, checking my watch, it's 2023. No Zika vaccine. So there would be nobody, you know, there would be nobody in, in first or second grade right now if anybody listened. Um, so that you have that. Yeah, that's, um, it's very strange how public health becomes co opted by political, progressive political ideology and uh, in ways that are not made public but are obvious if you look at it. It's, uh, it's a sad thing. Yeah. Resist you, that. Humans, humans, you know? Yeah, humans. It's true. Yep, 100%. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Kevin. I'll post this soon, and uh, uh, I hope you uh, have a, a good a course in medical school. Uh, you're clearly smart enough, and you've got the right stuff. I hope they realize it, and um, if I can help you in any way future, uh, let me know. Sure thing. Uh, what do I call you, uh, Randy or Dr. Yeah, Bob? Randy's good. Randy, okay. Yeah. So thanks. I appreciate that, Randy. All right. Thank you so much. We're going to say goodbye to our audience. Thanks for having me.